This is part four in our series about color vision. In this video, we will cover color reception by the cones in the retina and processing into color opponent channels. Stare at the center of this oddly colored flag for five seconds or so. Four, five, then look at this white space. The after image is a properly colored flag. How odd. Understanding how these colors leave an after image like this tells you a lot about how color vision works. Here is the plan for what we will cover in this video. First, cones in the retina sense different wavelengths of light and generate nerve impulses, which undergo a first step of processing by ganglion cells in the retina. The nerve impulses are then carried to the brain where color information gets further processed into three separate color opponent channels, which ends creating the colors you see. We will look at each of these steps in detail. In this series, we are covering color vision in three steps, color in light, reception by the eye, and perception by the brain. In the first set of videos, we covered color basics in particular using light in additive creation of color, color matching, and the creation of the color map called the chromaticity diagram. Light from the outside world is focused by the cornea and lens. Within the eye, the retina is the part that senses light with specialized photoreceptor cells called rods and cones. As the photoreceptors receive the light, that triggers a nerve impulse that travels along the optic nerve back to the brain. If we take a piece of retina and examine it under a microscope, you see there are three layers of nerve cells, ganglion cells on the top, bipolar cells in the middle, and located in the bottom cell layer are the photoreceptors, the rods and cones, so named because of their shapes. It seems somewhat unexpected that light coming in from the top must filter through all the cell layers before it reaches the receptors. The cones function in bright light and give us our color vision. In dim light, rods give us grayscale vision like this. They do not contribute to color vision in daylight. Estimates of the total number of colors we can distinguish range into the millions. How do you sense such a wide range of colors? Historically, in the early 1800s, Thomas Young and later Hermann von Helmholtz realized your eye could not possibly hold a receptor for each color and have them all spread throughout the retina. They theorized that all colors could be perceived by a combination of just three receptors, one red, one green, and one blue, which much later were identified as the cones. They theorized that as an image falls on the retina, each receptor sends a separate color signal to the brain which assembles that information into an image you recognize. It makes a nice, clear mental picture, easy to understand. However, it is only the beginning of the story. We will look at the rest in a moment, but first, more about the cones. This graph shows the region of the spectrum that each of the three cone types is sensitive to. The naming convention works like this. Blue light has a short wavelength. So these are called either blue cones or S cones. On the spectrum, its peak sensitivity is at 437 nanometers. Here is the peak of rod sensitivity, but rods don't contribute to color vision. The green sensing cone operates in the middle wavelengths, so it is called an M cone. Peak sensitivity is 533 nanometers. Toward the red end, this cone senses longer wavelength light, so it is called an L cone. Peak sensitivity is 564 nanometers. Note how the range of each cone overlaps the others. Now, for your amusement, you may note that the cone peak sensitivities are not actually at blue, green, and red. They are closer to violet, green, and yellow green. But the naming conventions of red, green, and blue are long set, so there's no point worrying about that. That is why color researchers often use the L, M, and S initials. As showers of photons arrive, they trigger nerve impulses from the cones. Depending on the proportion of nerve impulses from each cone type, we end up sensing a particular color. Also, 
it is possible for us to sense the same color from different distributions of incoming light. This is an important point, so we'll take a minute. For example, take a light from the spectrum of a single wavelength, say yellow at 580 nanometers. Alternatively, by adding the right amount of red and green light, you can create a yellow that you cannot distinguish from the pure spectral yellow. Did you expect that? If you looked at the previous video about color matching, you recall the formal experiment that demonstrated by adding various amounts of the primary colors, red, green, and blue, any spectral color could be matched. In the case of yellow, equal amounts of red and green light produced a match to yellow at 580 nanometers. If you pass the single wavelength yellow light through a prism, it will be bent, but it will remain the same yellow color. But if you pass the red-green mixture through a prism, it will be split into its two components. Pretty cool. Within the retina, here is how the circuitry is organized. Each cone is connected to other nerve cells in the retina. Usually, the output of several cones is gathered by a ganglion cell that sums the response for that area of the retina. The area of cones that feed into that ganglion cell is called a receptive field. In the fovea, with the finest detail vision, it is one cone to one ganglion cell. To picture this, consider an area of the retina. There will be many overlapping receptive fields gathering cone output. Now, a receptive field is organized in a particular way, into center and surround areas, like a bullseye. The center is fed by cones of one type, while the surround is fed by cones of another. If hitting the center excites the ganglion cell, it is an on center. Hitting the surround area with an opposite input inhibits the ganglion cell, which is called an off surround. And there can be the opposite setup, an inhibitory off center and an excitatory on surround. Color vision researchers have found four arrangements in the retina. One, a center of red cone activation with a surround of green cone inhibition. Two is a green center with a red surround. Technically, blue also inputs into this system. Here is the other center surround pair with blue versus yellow. Now is the time to note this system is divided into red versus green and blue versus yellow pairs. One term for this is a cone opponent system. Let me repeat that. We have just seen cones feeding into ganglion cells in a center surround organization, creating a cone opponent system. But we're not through yet. Young and Helmholtz thought they had a sound explanation for color vision using just cones. But there are aspects of color vision that weren't accounted for by this theory. To try and explain those issues, an Austrian named Ewald Herring proposed an alternate system that divided color perceptions into three channels, black-white, red-green, and blue-yellow. He called this opponent color theory. He based his opponent concept on two main findings. First, this is something you may not have noticed, but there are certain combinations of colors that don't exist in ordinary perception. For example, we can perceive purple as a combination of blue and red, but we cannot perceive a color that is a combination of blue and yellow. There is no bluish yellow. Likewise, there is a perception of orange as a combination of yellow and red, but there's no color perceived as greenish red. These pairs of colors, blue and yellow and red and green, are mutually exclusive, so they are called opposing or opponent colors. Supporters of the two theories of color vision cones versus opponent colors, battled for many years. Time passed, and researchers got a better look at the detailed workings of the retina and color processing. Eventually, it looked like both theories were correct. So let's look at how the opponent color process works. Color information that started in the retina is divided into three separate channels. One channel is for luminance, black versus white, Another channel is for blue versus yellow, and the third is for green versus red. Here are all three color axes. 
Any color can be specified by location in this opponent color space. Here is how each of the channels works. The channel for luminance receives its input from red and green cones. That determines the black versus white range. In the blue-yellow color channel, the blue input is from the blue cone, of course, but where is the yellow cone? Yellow, you may remember, comes from the combination of red plus green. So, by the relative input of the cones into the blue-yellow channel, the incoming light is judged to be either bluer or yellower. The red-green color channel also gets input from all three cones. In this channel, the incoming light is judged to be either redder or greener. So here is the whole circuit, which yields the opponent color channels. Now let's give you a different view, and then we will return to the circuit. Here is another way of looking at the result of opponent color response. This is the blue versus yellow channel. Below 500 nanometers, the blue side dominates. Above 500 nanometers, yellow dominates. The red versus green channel looks like this, with red dominating at each end and green in the middle. When you put the opponent channel functions together, here is the result. Let's take a look at a specific example. Take blue at 450 nanometers. The red channel has input, as does the blue channel. The sum of the two inputs is this specific blue. As a second example, we take yellow at 580 nanometers. Note at this point the green and red have canceled each other. Green-red input is at zero or neutral, leaving yellow from the blue-yellow channel. Every color is perceived through a balance between these two channels. Now let's see if we can put all this together. Starting with the cones, input into the ganglion cells makes the first separation into blue-yellow and red-green orientation. These are the cone-opponent channels. When this was first discovered, it seemed that this would be the mechanism for color opponency. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Experiments show this output does not match our final color experience. There's another step in color processing that occurs in the cortex that yields color results that do match our perceptions. What does this mean, match our perceptions? If color processing was only by the three cones, this is approximately what the spectrum would look like. After cone-opponent processing, this is what arrives at the lateral geniculate nucleus. Most of the colors are there, but they are not in quite the right places. After the final stage of processing, the colors end up in the places we are accustomed to seeing them. We can't leave opponent colors without specifically recognizing the unique hues. For a long time, it has been recognized there are four psychologically elementary colors, blue, green, yellow, and red. They are unique in that they are pure, not seen as combinations of other colors. In theory, these colors occur where one channel is at its neutral point, leaving the other color channel unopposed. A minute ago, we identified a spot where red and green canceled. That left yellow unopposed. That is the site of unique yellow at 580 nanometers. Red and green also cancel at a second spot. This leaves blue unopposed. In other words, this is the site of unique blue at about 475 nanometers. Likewise, there is a spot where blue and yellow cancel. This is the site of unique green, about 500 nanometers. I've taken these numbers from the original Jameson and Hurwitz paper. Later research has shown quite a bit of variation between people in the location of the unique hues. For your amusement, you might notice these colors turn up in lots of places. Let's now go back to our flag demonstration. The complementary nature of the colors in the after image was the other main clue that there had to be more to color vision than the three cone colors. Staring at the yellow fatigues that part of the blue-yellow channel, leaving blue temporarily dominant. And likewise, staring at the green leaves the red temporary, temporarily dominant. Let us finish by making an estimate of the amount of colors we can see. One way to think about this is to start with the spectrum. 
we can distinguish about 180 pure spectral colors. Then there is all the variation in saturation and luminance to be accounted for. Here is one way of calculating a number provided by Professor Knights of the University of Washington. First, with one cone type, there is no color actually, color space is one dimensional, in which we can distinguish about 200 levels of gray. Adding a second cone creates a two-dimensional color plane. On the horizontal color axis, we can distinguish about 50 color steps. So 50 times 200 equals 10,000 colors. Adding a third cone adds a third dimension. If the result was a cube, then 10,000 times 50 equals 500,000 colors. This is Knights's diagram from which he projects over 2 million possible colors. In summary, perception of color starts with the cones. Cones input into retinal ganglion cells by a center surround organization that makes the first separation into blue-yellow and red-green orientation. These are the cone opponent channels. When this was first discovered, it seemed this would be the mechanism for color opponency. But experiments show this output does not match our final color experience. The next step in color processing occurs in the cortex, where the color opponent process yields color results that do match our perceptions. Here is the estimated color result from each of the stages of color processing. This is a good place to point out that researchers are still working on each of the above steps. In the coming videos, we will talk about the genes that control color vision and color blindness.